My name's Richard Weidler. I'm the author of this splendid book, The Golden Maze, A Biography of Prague. Uh, welcome, everyone, on this Friday night. Uh, I'm sitting in my study at home, which is, as you can see, if I move it around a bit, is literally a garret. The The roof is like that. Um, I've got a cat over here. So if you hear a kind of a yowling sound, it means he wants to be let out the window. So I may have to take a momentary break to let him do that. Um, he's like that. He won't understand that I'm doing a, a Facebook Live event for Dimix. I'm here to talk to you about my book, The Golden Maze. Um, I'll talk for about half an hour. I'll do some readings from it and take questions from you. So think up questions now, by all means, and I'm happy to answer anything you want to ask me. I've called this book A Biography of Prague uh, because it's a history of the city, but it's also intermixed with personal stories from myself and from uh, and from other people and also quite a bit of folklore, which is how I like to write books. It's not so different from uh, my earlier books, Ghost Empire and Stargoland, that I co-authored with Kari Gislason, where there's a lot of history in there, storytelling, folkloric stories from the past, and also personal travel. The first time I came to Prague was in 1990, January 1990. And this is why I've written the book. I had this unforgettable experience. Uh, this was at the time of Europe's Year of Miracles, which was the earlier year, 1989. And at the time, I was living in London, performing with a comedy group. And we had a London theatre season. And while this is underway in London, while I was living there, I was watching all these police states in Central and Eastern Europe just topple over one by one. First, it was Poland, then Hungary and then East Germany. And in November, when the Berlin Wall fell, I was just like jumping out of my skin. I wanted to be over there so badly, but I couldn't go there because I was doing this theater season and that was fine. But as soon as I could, as soon as our theater season ended, my girlfriend at the time and I got on a plane. Uh, we went to Berlin, first of all. And from there, we went to Prague, which was just in this excited aftermath of its own revolution, known as the Velvet Revolution. It was called the Velvet Revolution for its peaceful, gentle nature. And there's a picture that my girlfriend took of me, which you can see now, uh, Sue puts it up, of me at Prague Castle in January 1990. This is just a week or so after the dissident Václav Havel, the playwright, had been made president of this magical kingdom. And you can see me there. As you can see, very fortunately, I haven't changed a bit in 30 years yes not not changed one little bit and, and you can see me looking out on the city of prague there that's from the castle wall near st vitus cathedral and the city looks really lovely but it's quite grimy and saggy and it's 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 falling to bits the atmosphere when we arrived in prague was was thrilling it was one of the most enthralling and moving experiences of of my young life this is a, a city, one of the most fabled and most beautiful and mysterious cities in the world, which had been living under the thumb of a cruel police state for 40 years, 40 years, and it had been overthrown. And the clumsy apparatchiks who'd been running the joints into the ground had been kicked out nonviolently and replaced by Václav Havel, a hippie playwright, a man who'd been a dissident, a man who had been in jail for uh, years and years in, for his dissident activities. And he was the new president. And to, to give some sort of a sense of a flavor of the time, uh, Václav Havel, President Havel, uh, made Frank Zappa an advisor and invited Lou Reed to perform at the castle. There was this incredibly festive atmosphere in the city people couldn't quite believe it they pulled this off they'd had this glorious peaceful revolution and it it restored their sense of dignity and pride and gave them their freedom back again it was really really quite thrilling it felt at the time it felt to me a little bit like how it feels to fall in love there was this feeling of constant excitement there was uh that feeling of being relaxed and excited at the same time uh waking up every morning going wow i wonder what's going to happen today there was so much going on. I joined demonstrations against the secret police who were still operating, even though the regime had been overthrown. They were still sort of hanging around, looking at foreigners, taking down notes, and they were still in all the hotel receptions. The hotel we stayed in was this beautiful 
uh, Art Nouveau Palace in Wenceslas Square called the Hotel Grand Europa. And all the all the reception staff there were all, I now know, were members of the secret police. And <laughs> they were they were so rude. They were everyone in Prague was lovely, but the hotel staff, the secret police, were, were so incredibly rude. So my girlfriend and I made a bit of a sport to see to be super nice to them and just see what reaction you'd get. I'd go down in the morning and would say something like to the woman behind the reception desk who had this kind of tight permed hair and heavy mascara and a kind of a unhappy look on her face. I'd say, excuse me, can you tell me where I can make an international phone call from the hotel? And she'd say, it's completely impossible to do such a thing here. And so I said, well, can you advise me where else in the city I might be able to do make a, an international phone call and she said you think i spent all my time finding out such things for people like you <laughs> like that other than that though people were lovely friendly ever effervescent it was incredibly exciting we've got a picture here of what the velvet revolution looked like here what the atmosphere in the streets here's Václav havel the new president uh in the middle of the revolution leaning over a balcony uh talking to you can't quite see the size of the crowd in that picture, but it was around two to 300,000 people in Wenceslas Square, urging peaceful protest and a general strike. Uh, and the, they're normally quite reticent people, Pragas, and so the, to see them in this state of high excitement was, was really completely thrilling and lovely. One day I was up at Prague Castle. It might have been the day when that photo was taken, uh, near St Vitus Cathedral, and Václav Havel himself walked past, the new president. It was a freezing cold day. It was, you know, it was January, and so it was winter. And he was wearing, uh, as I recall, he was wearing like just shirt sleeves. I don't know quite how he was, he was pulling that off. Uh, he was smoking, and there was an entourage of people following him and uh, an attractive woman journalist standing next to him that he was flirting with as, as they walked past. Uh, I kept thinking of the whole time of that famous poem by William Wordsworth, which he wrote about the French Revolution way back when, and he said, bliss it was on that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. And that's what it felt like in Prague in those incredible months. And there was another aspect to it as well that made it uh, particularly moving for people of my age, I think, at the time. It's forgotten that the Cold War, there, were these, there was a moment in, in the 1980s when it looked like there would be a nuclear war. And when I came out of high school in the early 80s, I, I actually didn't think I'd live to see the age of 30. I thought that nuclear war between the superpowers, which was the United States and then the then Soviet Union, was inevitable. And so the Velvet Revolution marked the end of this period, which was the end of the Cold War. And... The, the example of how this felt at the time is one night, uh, my girlfriend and I went out to, to this commemorative place at the top of Wenceslas Square, which was to commemorate a protest by a student named Jan Palak, who had self-immolated in 1969 uh, as a protest against the Soviet occupation of the country. And this was the first time when a legal commemoration for this young man could be held. It was quite late at night and we were standing around there standing around this kind of this big wedding cake of melted candle wax near the statue of St. Wenceslas. And two soldiers came up to uh, Josephine and I and they, they, were, they were in their late teens and they were wearing these heavy greatcoats that looked too big for them. And one of them came to me and said, Pivo, Pivo, Pivo. And I didn't know much Czech at all, but I did know that Pivo means beer. And beer is quite, quite special in, in Prague. It's where Pilsner comes from. Well, it comes from Czechoslovakia anyway. Uh, it's it's it, it's beer is spectacularly good. Even under communism, the beer was good. So I said, sure, sure, come and drink beer with us. I thought it'd be kind of fun to chat to a couple of teenage soldiers. And uh, this guy, who was, his name was Jan, said to me, "Oh, uh, American?" And I said, oh, "No, no, I'm 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 Australian." And he went, "Ah, Australia, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth." Brisbane, like that. And I went, wow, you know, you know your geography. And he said, yes. Uh, he said, Australia, uh, music. He said, ACDC, ACDC. And then he started playing air guitar like Angus Young in the middle of Wenceslas Square, sort of playing air guitar and, and playing lead guitar and leaping across the cobblestones. So I, I, I rounded up Jan and his mate and my girlfriend and I went back to the Hotel Grand Europa, the me mezzanine bar, and, and we were drinking with him. And after two beers, he was he was quite shaken, and he became quite emotional. And he said to me, "Richard, we are friends." Yes, and I said, "Yes, we're friends." He said, "Listen to me, please, Richard." He said, 
Czechoslovakia, Australia, America, Germany, Poland. Please, one world, please, Richard, please, one world. And I said, yes, yes, yes. And he said, no, no, listen to me, please. Czechoslovakia, America, Australia, Russia. And it, when, as soon as he said Russia, there was a guy at an adjacent table who leapt up out of his chair, smashed his hand on the on the table, making all the glasses jump and went, no, Russia, not Russia, not Russia. And then he gave us all a handbill and marched off. And Jan just was looked at him and went back to saying, Richard, listen to me, please. Australia, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Poland, one world, please. And, and the thing was, it was all a bit silly, but he felt as a soldier, he wasn't going to fight and die or, or be obliterated in a nuclear war. So this was a moment for people of his generation and my generation where we felt our future was returning to us. We could now feel that we weren't going to die in some awful blistering nuclear holocaust. We could actually look at the future with optimism. And I think this is a moment where I, I went from being a pessimistic person to being an optimistic person by and large. I don't think I've ever been quite been able to shake that even as things have been going as the way they are. The other aspect of Prague that I think is um, very, very powerful for visitors, uh, for me and for many others as well, is just how weird it is. It's a very weird place. It's quite uncanny. It has this very strange vibe to it. It feels like nowhere else I've been in, in the world. There's something about its winding streets, its golden light at, at midnight, uh, the shape of it. Nothing's quite at right angles that feels very, very uncanny. Photographers have been able to grab, cap, try and capture this aspect. Uh, we've got a, I've got a picture here by the great Czech photographer, uh, Sudek, who, who just sort of is able to capture how oddly beautiful Prague is. When people, I think like Australians and Americans and Canadians go to Prague, we have very often feel this odd sense of homecoming, a sense of deja vu. And it takes a while, it took me a while to put my finger on it, what that feeling was. And I think it's because Prague is the landscape of the folk tales and fairy tales we're given as children, like from the Brothers Grimm and from other folk tales and fairy tales. And it's a kind of imaginative world that we inhabit. And then when we grow older, we walk away from it. But it's still there, this little ghost town in the back of our imagination. And, and so to walk into Prague is to suddenly have it there in real life, in 3D, all around you, which is why it, I think is one of the reasons why it feels so beautiful and uncanny to be there. But when I say it reminds you of the, the old fairy tales, I, think, I don't think it's the disney version of those fairy tales. It's the older, darker versions of those tales the ones, the original versions, where Cinderella's sisters have to lop off parts of their feet to get them into the glass slipper. And when Little Red Riding Hood is forced to dance naked in front of the big bad wolf before it devours her alive. And that's the end of the story. In the original tellings of Little Red Riding Hood, there's no helpful woodsman with an axe nearby. That's just the end of the story. That's Prague. It has that slightly prickling, unnerving feeling it feels like it's on the edge of that and to explore that idea i've looked at the founding myths of the city prague is an unusual place insofar as its its founder its mythical founder is a woman now this is a witch princess whose name is labusha now there's no evidence labusha actually existed her name has been passed down though through these these folk tales of the origins of Bohemia and of Prague that have been coming down for more than a thousand years and were first recorded a thousand years ago by a priest called Cosmos of Prague. And the story goes that Labusha had the gift of foresight. And one afternoon she stood on a, on a cliff, on a bluff, looking down at the Vultava River, which is the river that courses through the middle of Prague. And her eyes became dreamy and she said, she, she uttered a prophecy. She said, I see a great city its glory will touch the stars. And then she turned to her attendants beside her and said, go down into the forest below the cliff and there in a clearing, find the man who is making the best use of his teeth 
at midday. So his, her courtiers did as they were bid. They went down into the forest, and in a clearing they found three men making a house. Now, two of the men were sitting there eating their lunch. The third one was sawing using a saw at a block of wood, and the courtiers knew they'd found their man, making the best use of his teeth at midday. And they asked him what he was making, and he said he was making a threshold for a house, a pra. Threshold means is pra in the Czech language, which is how it gets its name, Praha or Prague. And Threshold is a, a really wonderful name for such a city. Uh, I've, I think it's always felt to me like the threshold of some otherworldly place. And Prague, Prague is a place where all sorts of strange creatures of their imagination have found their way into the world across the threshold of Prague. It's in Prague we get the legend of the golem of Prague, the big Jewish uh, a monster made out of river mud created by the legendary Rabbi Lerv in the in uh, the Renaissance period. It's Prague where you get the Franz Kafka tale of Metamorphosis, where Gregor Samsa wakes up one day to discover he's been transformed into a giant cockroach. And it's Prague where you get the first robot. Robot is a Czech word. Robot means forced labor. And the first robot appeared on a stage in a play by a Czech writer called Karol Čapek. He appeared on the stage in Prague in a play called R.U.R. Where, these, where he envisaged a future where technology would create artificial humanoids that eventually uh, take over and want to um, exterminate humans, which is a really uh, old-fashioned Terminator idea now. But it was completely brand new in the 1920s when, when uh, Karol Čapek introduced robots on stage in his play. Um, I'm going to read a, a part of my book now. This is uh, from the introduction where I've written a bit about this whole idea of Prague as a threshold. A threshold in a children's tale is a device that serves as a point of transition from the everyday world into the dream realm. Ideally, it's a commonplace object, a looking glass, a wardrobe in an attic, a broken gate at the bottom of a meadow. So many visitors to Prague over the centuries have noticed this uneasy liminal quality the uncanny stillness of the streets on a winter's night can make the waking world appear thin and diaphanous. Even the drab Soviet-era apartment blocks of Prague can seem airless and haunted. Patrick Lee Fermer, who came in the early 1930s, was unsettled by Prague's strangeness. There were moments, he wrote, when every detail seemed the tip of a phalanx of inexplicable phantoms. Troubling creatures that haunt the world's imagination have found their way across Prague's threshold. A golem made from river mud, a human transformed into a cockroach, a factory made humanoid. An easy 10 minute walk through the city can take you from a clock that runs backwards to another where the skeleton of death chimes the hour every hour. Along the way you pass through squares once splashed with the blood of heretics, houses where alchemists attempted to transmute base matter into gold and churches strafed with Nazi bullets. One of the names that keeps cropping up when you talk about Prague's history is the name Wenceslas. That's the English version of the Czech name Václav. Uh, people, when they hear Wenceslas, are instantly reminded of the Christmas carol, Good King Wenceslas, which does refer to a real-life person, the very first Wenceslas the ruler of the province of Bohemia. He wasn't actually a king, he was a duke. Uh, the Pope hadn't allowed them to call themselves kings at that point. They were still dukes. So the ballad, the song, The Christmas Carol of Good King Wenceslas is actually about Duke Wenceslas I of, of Prague, who was uh, considered a very, very pious ruler. Uh, the legend about him goes that uh, Wenceslas apparently harvested his own grapes and wheat so he could make uh, Holy Communion himself, the bread and wine for Holy Communion on, on himself. Tragically for poor old Wenceslas, uh, he was murdered, murdered by his brother, who then took the throne from him. Uh, but he's remembered as a saint, an early martyr of the church, uh, which is why there's a big heroic statue of Wenceslas in Wenceslas Square, the big sort of boulevardy square, uh, in the new town of Prague. Uh, it's a preposterous statue, the one that's at the top of the of the uh, square there, because he's, he's this macho warrior 
on horseback carrying a, a lance when in fact Wenceslas was bookish and pious and there's another sweeter statue of him on the Charles Bridge which represents him uh, I think a lot better. The Charles Bridge where that statue stands is one of the most unforgettable places in Prague. We have a picture of it here. The Charles Bridge was founded by one of the great philosopher kings, if you like, of, of Prague's history. This was the emperor, Charles IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, who ruled in the city in the 14th century and made it into a showcase capital of the Holy Roman Empire. And you can see the spires in the background there of St. Vitus Cathedral. It was he who commissioned that. It was Charles IV that commissioned the Stone Bridge, the child, which was later named for him, the Charles Bridge, across the river. He commissioned the first university in Central Europe, which is the Charles University, and he built the new town of Prague, which is not so new. It goes back to the 14th century. There's a story that says that when Charles IV founded the Charles Bridge, he did so at a very specific moment. He consecrated the bridge on the date, which was the 9th of July in the year 1357 at 5.31 a.m. Now, why such a specific time? Well, it turns out all those numbers, if you jumble them together, they form a palindrome. They read the same forwards as they read backwards. If you put the, the numbers of the year, the day, the month, the hour, and the minute, they go one, three, five, seven, nine, seven, five, three, one. So the numbers go up and down like a bridge. And the symbolism of that moment was that the, the moment itself would give the bridge some structural integrity and help it stand up unlike its previous version which got washed away in a flood the kookiest emperor ever to rule over prague and bohemia was this guy we've got another pic here here he is painted by the great italian artist archimboldo completely in vegetables <laughs> uh, this is Char this is the emperor rudolf ii the habsburg emperor and the Italian artist Archimboldo, who painted that, was part of his court. He did similar paintings of other people. And there he is. I think he's being autumn there. He's representing autumn with autumn vegetables and flowers and fruits. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful painting. Rudolf II was an extraordinary character. He was a classic Habsburg ruler. Uh, he was the subject of way too much interbreeding within the Habsburg family. He uh, took the throne without ever really wanting to. He was shy, uh, very intelligent, uh, depressive, paranoid, and not really up to the business of running an empire. So he looked for shortcuts to knowledge and shortcuts to power. Like a lot of people who were scholarly at that time, in the we're talking here about the 1500s, early 1600s, he imagined that the world, the whole, the whole universe, was a puzzle created by God. Great big complicated puzzle that you could figure out if you just knew he, God gave us reason to be able to help us un, disentangle it all. And he was looking for the secret web of correspondences, the secret links that hold the cosmos together. So he invited brilliant uh, astronomers to Prague, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler. Kepler was his uh, mathematician and uh, Kepler just decoded the true nature of planetary motion while he was in Prague. But he also invited alchemists and magicians, alchemists, because he hoped that they could turn crude matter into gold and create the elixir of eternal youth. He really believed that. And magicians, Dr. John Dee, Queen Elizabeth's magician, came to Prague for a while with his charlatan sidekick, Edward Kelly. They were there with a showstone to decode the secret language of angels while they, while they were in Prague and to deliver a warning to the emperor to clean up his act and become a good person of God once again. There was a lot of strangeness going on in Prague at the time, but it was a vivid and exciting time. Prague has had a tragic history uh, in, for, in, in many ways. Um, it's, there was the famous uh, Battle of White Mountain that took place uh, in, in the 1600s after the reign of Rudolf II, whereby pretty much the Habsburg Catholic Empire uh, imposed a kind of Catholic tyranny on the place. Uh, then you have this moment where they, they're part of the Habsburg Empire for, for centuries. But after the First World War, when Austrian Hungarian Austro Hungarian Empire fell apart, they went and formed their own republic. And it was a very successful republic. 
uh, known as Czechoslovakia. The the name was kind of long and double barreled but nonetheless, it was a proper democracy with respect for human rights uh, and a pros- and a prosperous, thriving, and and a, a huge cultural ferment at the time. But tragically, utterly tragically, this was destroyed by Adolf Hitler, whose German nation was sat on the border there. There were a great many German people living in Prague, uh, in in uh, Bohemia and Moravia on the borderlands of Czechoslovakia. Uh, Hitler got the Western democracies to connive to give them to him. This was a terrible betrayal of a democracy. And that's Adolf Hitler there at Prague Castle after the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1939. Once he'd invaded Czechoslovakia, they finally realized the creature that they were dealing with. After the Second World War, which you could arguably be said began and ended in Prague, the final battles of the Second World War actually took place in Prague. Uh, then there was a brief sort of return to democracy, kind of, sort of, until a, a, a Soviet-led uh, communist coup d'etat took place. And again, they fell into the deep chill. And then there was this Prague Spring, this moment in the uh, 1968 where they tried to liberalise and they tried to introduce freedom of speech under communism. But that too was quashed by an invasion by the Soviet Union. When the Soviets invaded in 1968, it created terrible torment. And some of the most incredible stories in my book are from that day, uh, from what happened on that day. The extraordinary coincidence took place with this, uh, with one of one of the people I interviewed for the book, which is really one of the most remarkable stories I've ever put to paper. I think something that took place on that day. After that, the totalitarian state really set in again, and it was conducted on this atmosphere of total mistrust of each other. The state was devoted to having the secret police creep into every aspect of life in Prague at the time. Uh, all kinds of people became police informants and it became, they were quite tragically so. At this time, they discovered, uh, after the, the Velvet Revolution, they discovered, looking at the secret police archives, that husbands had been spying on wives, brothers had reported on sisters, People in the dissident movement had found that best friends had been reporting on them the whole time to the secret police. The point was to disintegrate trust, to to create an environment where people couldn't trust each other and make people complicit in dobbing in each other to the police. Those who cooperated with the secret police would get to the head of the queue for an apartment or a car. Those who didn't, those who spoke out against the state, would find that their children couldn't get educated, they'd be sacked from their jobs, and perhaps they'd even go to prison. To give a flavour of the paranoid surveillance state, I'll just do another reading before I take your questions on this. Uh, this is a, a, part of a chapter called The Ear. And this is how Prague has used jokes to cope with the craziness of that time where everyone's spying on everyone else in the late 60s, early 1970s. The Ear. Three apparatchiks came to Prague one month for a party conference. After the first day, they sat up late in their hotel room, drinking and telling stories. The alcohol loosened their tongues a little, and they began to complain about the secret police. One of them hushed the other two and whispered, what if they're listening right now? The other two laughed. So the man decided to play a joke on his friends. He went downstairs to the hotel reception and asked the woman at the desk to deliver three cups of tea to the room in 15 minutes. When he rejoined his friends, he sat down and leant towards a vase of plastic flowers and said, hello, comrade major. Could you have three cups of tea sent up to our room, please? His friends laughed, but when the tea arrived, they blanched, made their excuses and went to bed. The next morning, the man went out for a walk, but when he returned to the hotel, his friends were gone. He asked the receptionist what had happened to them. They've been arrested, she said. They would have arrested you too, but the Comrade Major really liked your joke about the tea. The dread that one's conversation might be overheard was the subject of many jokes from this time. Some were long, shaggy dog's tails, but others achieved a kind of pithy perfection. An American visits a Czech relative in Prague. How are things going, he asks. Oh, you know, replies the Czech. Can't complain. The secret police devoted enormous resources to keeping tabs on troublemakers. The dissident writer Ludwig Watzelik and his wife Madler discovered tiny microphones hidden in every room in their apartment. Their phone was bugged, 
and another apartment in their block was taken over by STB agents to monitor their conversations. Thus, for 20 years, they avoided discussing anything of significance out loud and wrote it down instead on flushable sheets of toilet paper. It's hard to overstate the sheer weirdness of normalization. Amid the dullness, there was a through the looking glass quality to daily life in which people were expected to accept six impossible things before breakfast. The terrible dinginess, the shortages, the suppression of honest opinion were at odds with President Husak's claim that life was getting better and sweeter. Communism seemed both unsustainable and unkillable. In 2018, on a long four-hour flight from Perth to Sydney, I fell into conversation with the woman sitting next to me, Anna, who had grown up in communist Poland. I asked her if she'd ever travelled to Czechoslovakia during those years, and she recalled spending a summer at a friendship camp in Spitzak, near the German border, with a group of other kids from the Soviet bloc. One day, she said, the camp administrator informed them that an important party dignitary would be visiting to make a speech, and they would have to make the camp look nice for the official photographs. But there was a problem, Anna explained. The lawn in front of the hostel had dried out. So all of us were given buckets of green paint to make it look good for the cameras. You painted the lawn green, I asked. We painted the lawn green. With brushes or rollers? With brushes, she said. So what happened when the party dignitaries came? They came, they made their speeches, of course. The happy photos were taken, and then after they left, the lawn completely died. I had to ask if the pictures of the event were published in colour or black and white. Oh, black and white, she said, smiling. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to take questions now. If you have them, go right ahead. Have you revisited since your first trip in the 90s? How much has it changed? Yes. Uh, a chunk of this book was written at the beginning of last year. I was given a writer's residency in Prague in January and February last year. And that was wonderful. I got to spend two whole months in the city, walking around it every day, writing every day. I met um, and met some very good friends there, uh, one of whom appears in the book, an author called Marek Toman, who's a, uh, a, a local Prague author and who works in the Department of Foreign Affairs there. Uh, yeah, it had changed so much. Um, it had been cleaned up a lot. Uh, the shabbiness had gone. The, the buildings had been painted. The roofs had been fixed. The scaffolding had come down. It was looking pretty spick and span and much, much wealthier. Uh, that was great. Even in winter, there were still too many tourists. I can't complain. I was, you know, I was another foreign traveler like them. It's too selfish of me to complain. But nonetheless, there were still too many of them. But you could still get that eerie feeling in Prague if you if you walking walking through the streets late at night or very, very early in the morning. Crossing the Charles Bridge at three o'clock in the morning is still a kind of an eerie and uncomfortably creepy experience. Uh, the shops that sold nothing much in particular in Prague had changed and they were gone. Uh, there were shops back in the day in the communist era that sold nothing but mineral water and different kinds of mineral water, which was sold as medicine for various kinds of ailments, like for arthritis or for gout or what have you. you know, like this bottle here from Kolovivari, this is, this is the good stuff for that. And there was a shop that I remember there was this gorgeous little sweet shop that sold nothing but bookmarks, <laughs> ex libris slips and tiny little, tiny little hardback little books that, with Shakespeare sonnets written in, in Czech. Well, they've all been replaced by tourist uh, knickknack shops like the have, ones we have in Australia in most of our capital cities. In Prague, you know, here they sell you know, plastic boomerangs and shot glasses and kangaroo paw bottle openers and what have you. In Prague, it's like little bottles of absinthe. It's a matryoshka dolls, the ones that, you know, doll inside a doll inside a doll. Uh, and uh, T-shirts and tea towels with Franz Kafka on them, but not Kafka's books. Uh, that's a little depressing. But, you know, what do you... I, I, the revolt against communism was a, a, at least as much an economic one as it was a political one. It's lost a little bit of its soul in the process, but like I said, it's all still there. Nothing's really been torn down. Uh, what has been there has been repaired and it's looking better than ever. So it swings and roundabouts. And I still absolutely love being there. I'm always very happy there. Uh, I, I, I went away to Berlin for a weekend 
while I was there for two months and couldn't wait to get back to Prague. I, I felt happy and stimulated and, and safe there. It's wonderful. Uh, from Cassie, who says, do you prefer researching the history or the folk tales more? Oh, Cassie, I, I, history, the history is hard graph. You've got to go through the sources and uh, the researching of that is, is patient and careful and painstaking. So after having done a fair bit of that, which is enjoyable enough, but having, after having done that, finding the folk tales is a real joy. It's a real pleasure because uh, it's not so much about getting the exact date right, finding the context, getting different points of view. Uh, it, it's really about the flourish of the story and all the crazy ass things that are hiding behind the story, all the secret fears and hopes and dreams and the odd things that lie behind it. They're, they're, they're a real joy. There's a certain kind of folktale I look for. I'm, I'm, I really try and be careful about the folktales I present. They've got to have a moment in them where, you, where the story's coming along and then something happens, which completely throws the whole story out of whack. And you go, well, now I don't know what the story's about. I've got a story like that in the book, in, in, in The Golden Maze. Uh, it's a story from the Jewish ghetto of Prague. Uh, it's called The Golden Monkey, which is a wonderful story. And uh, that definitely fits the bill for that, that weirdness, that little twist in the story that flips the story around. And you just go, you go well, I'm helpless before the story now because I don't know what's going to happen next. They're the tales that I like the most. More questions? Uh, Veronica says, Richard, beyond your understandable and relatable fascination with Prague, do you have any other connection to Prague? Not a family one, I'm afraid. Um, I read a lot of its literature before I ever went there. I read a lot of its stories. Uh, I had really, or I'd already read uh, Milan Kundera's uh, the unbearable lightness of being, and his uh, the book of laughter and forgetting, which I went back to after thirty years. And you worry about those books. You know the ones you loved in your twenties, and you go back to them. You worry then they're, they're not going to stand up, but they did. They they really did stand up. Uh, I enjoyed reading those. I, I, I'd read that. I'd read a fair bit of uh, another Czech author whose work is wonderful called Ivan Klima, and uh, another writer called Joseph Švoretsky who wrote the engineer of human souls. The Engineer of Human Souls it was the title he gave to his book. It was a, a phrase coined by Stalin. That was how Stalin referred to writers. He gave them that kind of industrial sort of way of talking about them, engineers of human souls. That's, that's pretty creepy. Uh, so I'd already had this kind of, I, I think, a connection insofar as I adored Czech uh, literature, Prague literature, before I ever went there. And, some, and the music as well, uh, the music of Dvorak, Schmetana, and above all, uh, Leos Janacek. Janacek's music is this kind of gorgeous, gorgeous, heavenly uh, 20th century piano music, late 19th, 20th, 20th century piano music, which is, it's a bit like Debussy, a little bit like it, but it's all unto itself. And you can hear the Czech countryside in that music. It's, it, it's beautiful, beautiful, wonderful music. So that, that was the only connection I'd had with the place before I ever went there, other than um, a kind of a deep curiosity about it. It's one of those places you go, I think I'd heard so much, uh, had read about obliquely and uh, I'd had quite high expectations about going there. And when I did go there for the first time in the Velvet Revolution, of course, it, 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 all my highest expectations were doubled and tripled. Uh, I, I never forgot it. And it's why it's taken me, I think, so long to write the book. Uh, Timothy said, did you ever cross the Charles Bridge at 3 a.m.? It's said to have invisible phantoms walk upon it. Um, yes, it is said to have done that. There's, there's lovely stories about strange things that occur on the Charles Bridge. Rabbi Lerv, the great scholarly rabbi of Prague, um, who, who apparently met with Emperor Rudolph II, uh, there's a legend that he once was standing there on the Charles Bridge and the emperor's carriage was coming towards him and he raised his hand and with a gesture, he turned the whole carriage into an exploding mess of butterflies. Uh, I love that story. Um, the thing about the Charles Bridge is uh, it does have this famous avenue of statues of saints, bronze and stone saints. They went there when it was first built by uh, the Emperor Charles IV. They came later. And the, the, the avenue of, of saints along the bridge is, is one of the great glories of Prague. And 
and it wouldn't be the same without it. But I, I, I began to realize I was, as I was writing the book, I think for the people who were living in Prague at the time, who were largely Protestant, if that's the word for it, uh, Protestant, to have these Catholic saints along the bridge was a form of intimidation for them, I think, for, many, for a great many of them. Uh, now they're just seen as charming and harmless, but they had a kind of eerie supernatural power to them. And certainly walking across the bridge at 3 a.m., you, you sort of get the idea that somehow they're moving when you're not looking, <laughs> which is not true, but it's a fanciful thing. Christine says, did you get a chance to talk to long-standing locals to get a feel about how they feel about modern-day Prague with all its tourists? Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, they have mixed feelings about it, by and large. They, um, they know that Prague's prosperity has been based on all the tourists and it's made a, the, the city rich and safer as a result. But it's hollowing out the centre of Prague. This is a problem a lot of cities are having with Airbnb. Uh, apartments are given over for Airbnb and people come and go. Um, the shops that normally would, you know, hardware shops and um, delis and all those places that would normally service uh, an ongoing resident population start to disappear and replaced by more tourist shops. It's what's happened to Venice. It's what it's what's happened to Reykjavik in Iceland. You know, that's it's it's terrible what's happened there in many ways. Yeah, they're they're a bit down on it, but they didn't complain about it too much. I, I think I think the feeling is, yeah, this isn't great, but it's better than communism. It's better than how things were under communism, which was a constant, constant sort of pushing on on your kind of sense of dignity and integrity on an almost daily basis that was uh, res deeply resented. Uh, it, it turned people into liars and hypocrites. Uh, that that old system. It forced people to sort of bow to the ruling ideology uh, all, all the time. So they, have, they, they do have mixed feelings about it. There was a kind of great dissident band called the Plastic People of the Universe and the uh, saxophonist, a guy called uh, Vladislav Brabenets, his name is, uh, he says, effing tourists, they're as bad as the Russians, he says. Best meal? Ah, and what distinguishes a typical Pragian, Praga, Praganite? <laughs> Best meal is easy. That's an easy thing. You go to Wenceslas Square, you go to the uh, kiosks there, and they sell these amazing Prague sausages. It's essentially a, a, a delicious, spectacularly delicious hot dog with, with mustard and sauce and onions and everything else and and uh, a Pilsner beer. You can drink Pilsner while you're eating this sausage and bread thing. Oh, splendid. Nothing like it. In fact, um, it, it has the kind of all the lure of a bunning sausage sizzle except the sausage is actually good <laughs> when you get there um uh, other than that there's um i remember when i went there and uh, i had dinner one night in a what was thought to be quite a, a fancy restaurant at the, during the velvet revolution probably i couldn't afford to go there now but it was certainly very cheap then uh and i was sitting at a table of four and we were eating we ordered you could order pork schnitzel uh veal schnitzel and chicken schnitzel and all three tasted exactly the same all three were served with dumplings and and cabbage which was fine uh and dessert was dumplings with apricot jam that was pretty good actually and the beer oh, always sensational and what distinguishes a praga it's definitely humor 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 are willing to take the piss are willing to poke fun at authority this is how they've coped with tyranny uh, one of the guides one of this uh, one of the um moments we knew in the in the velvet revolution was about to happen was a, a group of students formed an organization that they called the society for a merrier present and they organized a military type march over the charles bridge and these young guys they they had helmets that were made from watermelon shells and they were carrying salami sticks for truncheons and they were holding up banners with blank sheets on them with nothing written, nothing written on them at all, but holding them up and marching behind these blank banners. And the police, came, when, the, when the police came along and confiscated the blank banners, all the observers just fell about laughing. They, they've done things like this all the time, the, uh, the, the Pragas. I think there's one more photo I can show you. You still got that there, Sue, of the, of the, this is of the crushing of the Prague Spring during the Soviet invasion. Uh, during the Soviet invasion of 68, they did all sorts of pranks to annoy the officials. They rotated the, um, uh, street signs, 90 degrees, to point them in different directions to send the tanks down the wrong street. Pragas walked around with transistor radios besides their ears to uh, <laughs> to get news from the BBC. 
and they were confiscated by the police. And so Prague is then confiscated, uh, compensated by getting blocks of coal and walking around with those pressed to their ears. And, and then the police confiscated those. Uh, they have this great um, tradition it, uh, following a, a wonderful book called The Good Soldier Schweik, which I've written about there too, where you follow orders to 120%. And in doing so, you completely undermine the uh, purpose of the exercise in the first place. This is a this is one of the most glorious things about Prague is that they have this incredible sense of humour and of thumbing their nose at authority. Even the current president, a guy called uh, Milos Zeman, he's uh, I'm not a fan of his. Uh, he's a bit of a, a race baiting uh, demagogue, uh, fan of Vladimir Putin's, and uh, joked with Putin once about liquidating journalists. Uh, it was a little too close to communist China for some students liking so. So a couple of years ago, a bunch of student art terrorists, they called themselves, uh, managed to break their way into Prague Castle, where the president lives, and dressed as chimney sweeps. They got up onto the roof of Prague Castle, the palace, the presidential palace. They took down the presidential flag and replaced it with a gigantic, gigantic 12 uh, high pair of red silk underpants. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they they took a kind of an ISIS type video of them sitting there with balaclava holding up the red underpants, and they said, "This is this is the banner for a president who has no shame." I love that aspect of them. I love that aspect of Prague's Prague's um, culture and character. They're larrikins, I suppose you'd say. Any more questions? Katie said, "What are some books about the place you really love and have inspired your writing?" Oh, look, I'm, I've got some here. I'm not just. I'll grab a couple of them if I can spot them in time. There's this classic book called Magic Prague by Angela Maria Ripolino. Uh, and yeah, here it is. I've got it up here. Excuse me. This is a wonderful book. I adored this book. It's hard to get hold of now. You have to get secondhand copies of it. Um, this, this captures so much of the ethos of Prague, written during the communist era. Um, I, I think uh, Milan Kundera is a problematic guy. Uh, He's had an interesting history. Uh, in the 1950s, he was a bit of a champion of and a champion of Stalin. He recanted on that in the 60s and then left and then wrote these wonderful novels. For all that, his novels are completely wonderful. The Book of Laughter and Forgetting and uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. But I think my favourite Czech novel is by Joseph Sarecki and it's called The Miracle Game. Uh, that's a wonderful novel. It's just great. It's just wonderful. And it's uh, translated by my friend Paul Wilson, who appears in the book, who sang with the uh, Plastic People of the Universe back in the day, and whose story is in in my book as well. I can thoroughly, absolutely strongly recommend those 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 novels. Ivan Klima's uh, Judge on Trial, Ivan, anything by Ivan Klima is always charming and delightful and thoughtful and uh, completely of its time. It is a funny thing, I think, that... Uh, that Prague's literature, communism brought about a golden age of, of Czech literature, uh, except hardly any of it could be published in, in Prague. It was, it was published elsewhere and translated into English and German and published elsewhere in the world. The communism, and most of it had to be suppressed. And now that there's free speech, the Czech literature to make the same imprint. The other great writer of, uh, of Prague to read is uh, an author called Bohemil Hrabal. It's a hard name to spell, H-R-A-B-A-L. Uh, he's written incredible books like Closely Watched Trains, which was made into a movie, and a hilarious book called I Served the King of England. And that begins, <laughs> that, that's the story, there's a, a waiter in it called Diti, and Diti's working in a plush Prague hotel. And on day one of the job, the, the matron comes to him and pulls him up by the ear, and he says to him, don't you forget, in this job, your job is you are to see nothing and to hear nothing. Have you got that? And he's holding him by the ear and he goes, yeah, yeah, I got that. And he lets him down again. Then he pulls him up by the other ear and he says, and don't forget, it's also your job to see everything and hear everything. Have you got that? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I've got that. Again, it, it, it's humor is, is a large part of Czech literature and the Czech experience. Last question. Last question. Uh, what's your place is going to be the next one? I don't yet. I've got a couple of ideas. I'm not inclined to say yet what they are. I've got, I have a few ideas. 
and one major idea. I'm sort of letting myself circle around them at the moment and see which one I keep returning to. And of course, a large part of it's predicated on travel, which I, we're not doing at the moment. So bring on the vaccine, man. Bring on that vaccine. And then perhaps after that, I'll be able to give a to that to that excellent question. I wish I could be more forthcoming at this point. Well, that's it. Um, thank you very much for joining me for this. Um, it, it's um, lovely to talk about my, my book. I put my heart and soul into this. This, uh, like I say, it took me 30 years to actually write this book, to be old enough to write it, I think, and to have the kind of insight I've needed for it. Uh, thank you to Sue, and thank you for those kind uh, comments you've been making as we go along. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and see you next time.